I'm Dr. Maya Bunick, Professor of General Pediatrics, and I'm Medical Director of the Child Health Clinic. I also have a breastfeeding faculty practice, and I'm here with Dr. Erica Wymore, who's Assistant Professor in the Department of Neonatal and Perinatal Medicine. We're here to talk to you about challenges with marijuana use and breastfeeding, and more specifically, talk to you about our study that was published in JAMA Pediatrics, The Persistence of THC in Human Breast Milk. So recognizing in our current climate today that we're having increasing legalization of marijuana throughout the country, we recognize that there is a lot of controversy about how providers and clinicians approach our patients and families who have evidence of perinatal marijuana use, either during pregnancy or postpartum. What we now see with the recent election is that nearly 31 states in the United States have legalized marijuana, either for recreational or medical marijuana use. Also, our northern Canadian neighbors legalized marijuana last year and it has gone into effect this past calendar year. The concerns with increasing legalization leads to concerns for increased perceptions of safety from the public. However, for certain vulnerable populations like children, adolescents, and particularly for pregnant and breastfeeding mothers, this may not be such a good idea and we should rethink the perception of legalization and that of safety. We really want to point out that just as we used to tell women in the 50s and 60s that it was okay to smoke during pregnancy and also drink alcohol, we have learned now that those are unsafe and have a lot of perinatal consequences. In our current climate of increasing legalization, we're also seeing a dramatic increase in the potency of marijuana products that are available to the consumer today. What we know is from the 1980s, the average THC content of the tetrahydrocannabinol um, psychoactive component of the marijuana plant that's in an average joint was about 4%. But now, with increasing legalization, we know that that's increased up to 25% on average in the state of Colorado. And different forms of marijuana products might have higher concentration, such as butane hash oil, such as shatter, or butter, which has a THC potency of 60 to 90 percent. Now currently, the data that we have available about perinatal marijuana exposure was started from long-term cohorts in the 1980s, when the THC content was about 4 percent. And what we know now is that we have very little evidence about the long-term implications of perinatal marijuana use with the current higher potency products that are available to our moms today. We also have concerns that those long-term cohort studies that were started in the 1980s examining THC exposure during pregnancy and long-term outcomes were started in the 1980s when THC content was about 4%. Those children of those mothers were found to have problems with cognition, memory, executive function that followed them long into childhood and into adolescence, although they found little effects in the early postnatal period or in young children. The concern is that we don't see the immediate effects of perinatal marijuana use, but it's not until many years later. Some of the challenges with studying perinatal effects of marijuana exposure have to do with how we ascertain that amount of exposure. What was the potency of the mother's use? How frequently did she use? Did she only use in the first trimester or throughout her entire pregnancy? In addition, the metabolism of THC is very complex. THC does not follow first order kinetics like alcohol does. THC is highly lipophilic and fat loving. Therefore, it goes through two phases of metabolism and may be the reason why we see prolonged excretion in the urine of people who have stopped using several weeks ago. However, for all of these reasons, this makes studying perinatal marijuana effects on long-term outcomes exceedingly difficult. We have just uh, begun to study all of these aspects of uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding, and um, we are fortunate in that the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, all really have come out with statements to say that there should be caution and abstention during the time of pregnancy as well as lactation. And there is still a desire to figure out what sorts of guidelines for moms should happen once the baby is born and mom desires to breastfeed. 
We set out to get some answers about how long marijuana lasts in breast milk because we were finding that locally uh, hospitals were using testing mom's urine or giving some general guidance on how many weeks to sort of pump and dump, but nobody knew for sure how long marijuana lasted in breast milk. And so we um, designed a study that would identify women at birth who were positive for marijuana and then follow them for six weeks um, postpartum and test their um, blood and their urine and their breast milk uh, for metabolites of marijuana and particularly we were interested in the psychoactive component of THC. We began our study initially in 2016 and had quite a bit of difficulty in getting IRB approval at that time and had anticipated that we were going to test infants as well as mothers during this study period. Again, we asked mothers to abstain from marijuana use after delivery and then obtained surveys of their history of marijuana use as well as multiple samples per week of milk, blood, and urine. We screened 394 women for this study and were only able to enroll 25 women into our study. However, of those 25 women, only 12 were able to abstain from marijuana by self-report by surveys and on chemical analysis, we found only seven were true abstainers. We found that THC was concentrated in the milk relative to plasma, which had been known before in one previous study, at approximately six to one concentration. Additionally, we found that urine toxicology testing did not correlate with abstention of THC in breast milk. As I mentioned previously, our study found significant issues with our participants being able to abstain from marijuana for the duration of the study. Our JAMA article focused on those seven abstainers. However, we do note that the women who didn't abstain had wide variability in their THC concentrations in their breast milk, anywhere from 50 to 100 times higher than women who were able to abstain. Among the seven women who were able to abstain for the six-week duration of the study, we found THC in their breast milk for the duration of the study, and the time to elimination was calculated to be approximately six weeks. This long duration makes pumping and dumping for six weeks for a mother who intends to breastfeed extremely difficult. Of note, this study was really a pharmacokinetic study, and it was not intended to assess safety. In talking to the women in our study, we also learned that it was really hard for them to abstain. The time after a baby's born is often really stressful, and most of these women told us that they used marijuana um, for sleep and for mood instability and for relieving stress. And so it does remain um, something that we were going to have to really deal with in terms of addressing this early in pregnancy and perhaps offering other things for moms um, in terms of supporting them so they uh, at least can abstain during the nine months of pregnancy and the year after birth that we really encourage all women to breastfeed. So in summary, um, marijuana legalization really has um, increased use uh, in pregnancy and in breastfeeding. And we wanna emphasize again that legalization doesn't mean safety. Um, and I think that we should probably be using caution to say until we know more about um, the effects on infants uh, long term that uh, we should just be conservative with our recommendations. Uh, just like we ask um, mothers to abstain from drinking and smoking and using other drugs in pregnancy, we should probably do that same with marijuana. Um, we also know that the potency of marijuana has increased sixfold since the early studies in the 1980s. Uh, the THC, unfortunately, is excreted for six weeks postpartum, and that's really the psychoactive component. And we really uh, want to tell them that it's really difficult to abstain after they've had delivery when they've been using it two or three times a week during pregnancy. So this messaging really needs to happen early in, in pregnancy and uh, should be something that is discussed uh, as part of prenatal care. 
And we really want to encourage supporting babies and being advocates for uh, children in terms of exposing them to these substances until we know more about uh, the longer term effects. So as Dr. Bunick mentioned, there's still a lot of uncertainties with regard to the long-term effects of perinatal marijuana use in today's current climate of higher potency marijuana, as well as that increased legalization and prevalence of use. We recognize there's many gaps in the current knowledge that's out there to support clinicians and families as well. Some future initiatives that we've highlighted that our research team is hoping to embark upon is further evaluation of the pharmacology and the pharmacokinetics of THC metabolism during pregnancy, and really trying to understand how we can approximate that loading dose, what products consumers are actually using, and what the physiologic effects are during pregnancy and during lactation. Additionally, we have very little information in regards to infant metabolism, which has been really difficult to study from a research perspective due to limitations of ethics of, of studying substance exposure in newborns. As stated previously, we also need to investigate how do we help support our prenatal providers when they do identify that a mother is using marijuana to a point that she needs support and help with abstinence. What are the best methods for supporting abstention and cessation of marijuana? What are alternatives? And what are some non-pharmacologic measures that we can help to support our families? And lastly, the differential effects of perinatal marijuana exposure are unknown. Is there a difference in effect if women use during the first trimester, second trimester, or third trimester? And are there differences in how preterm infants versus term infants metabolize THC once they've consumed this in breast milk? All of these concerns are unknowns, and at this time we really recognize that there are challenges in this arena for all providers and families. So moving forward, we recognize there's a lot of education and partnership with perinatal providers that needs to happen. As we stated, supporting our prenatal providers in education and techniques to help mothers with abstention, as well as providing as much education as possible to promote safe breastfeeding is a priority. We recognize that this is a difficult situation for all providers and that the current guidelines by the AAP, ACOG, and Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine recommend discouraging marijuana use during pregnancy as well as during breastfeeding. Consistency in our messaging will only help strengthen our relationships with our families and also recognize that there are limits with the evidence that we do have available but that legalization does not mean safety, and we should exercise caution until we know more about the effects of marijuana during this critical, vulnerable time for fetal and newborn development. We're really glad and proud that we could contribute to the body of literature on this topic, and we hope that uh, if you have any questions or are needing advice on how to approach some of these things in your own institutions, that you reach out to us. We also have some great information from our Colorado Department of Health and Environment uh, that we will provide for you at the end of this presentation. Thank you.